Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Can Am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And Huck is in the house and she's doing really good. She's been a good girl. Shake. Come on, shake. Shake. Oh, that's a good girl. And she wanted to say hi to everybody. And she wanted a little ear rub. Oh, that feels good. She likes that. But she's going to be monitoring our program today and making sure that we do a good job for you and essentially getting into everything of course but this is a this is a missing 411 seg segment about missing people of course and we're indoors today because we have thunderstorms in the Flathead Valley, which isn't good. And before I get too much into things, I wanted to say thank you to a couple people. There's a friend of mine who lives in Kingman, Arizona. And if you're in Kingman, get by this place. It's called the Mail Room. It's at 1308 Stockton Hill Road, Kingman, Arizona. Jeff has been a big supporter of our work. He owns a really nice shop there. Stop in and say hi. Another thing, I talk about Border Patrol all the time and how those men and women are working unbelievably hard. And I don't think they get enough recognition for what they do. They're doing jobs that they weren't even hired to do right now. And they're the last line of defense before people come into our country. Well, a border patrolman sent me a couple of patches and he sent a real nice letter and I appreciated that very much. And uh, I pray for those men and women all the time because they're, they're doing some dangerous work, really dangerous. And then another letter I got from a supporter. This person's from uh, Oklahoma, northeastern Oklahoma. Dave, I consider then as I do now that Sasquatch are people and certainly not animals. I also believe because of some very reliable stories that they possess supernatural abilities that we simply don't understand. Because of those topics, Dr. Ketchum suggested that I reach out to some people. She introduced me to them and I have benefited from that introduction. During some of my conversations, your name on occasion would come up. I quickly delved from that point forward into your work and was blown away. God bless you, brother, for all the things you do. I've watched all your movies multiple times. The latest one regarding the UFO connection hit home with me in, in a lot of ways. I retired from the Army in 2015. My last deployment was to Afghanistan. It was between 2012 and 13. It was there, a place called Terran Kot where I met several of my buddies, witnessed an extraordinary UFO event. That's something, isn't it? I won't go into that here because the letter will be way too long, but if you ever want to know about it, I'll be happy to provide it to you in detail. Yeah, please. I don't say that out of embarrassment. I say that because I do some contract work on the side and I can't have my name affiliated with that specific event. Doing so would put my current contract work in jeopardy. This is going to be somewhat off topic, but it really isn't. I've always been interested in primitive living skills since I was a child. Over the years, that would led me to how to produce stone tools through flint napping. During my last deployment, I would sometimes make stone points during my downtime and give them to my buddies. It was a creative way of taking my mind off stressful things. My friends always appreciated those little gifts in the field. They would smile like little kids when I would give it to them. If a soldier ever experiences any happiness in this world, it's always through childlike laughter. I found that making gifts by hand and giving them to someone is always more meaningful to the person receiving it than anything you could purchase. That is true. It may sound silly, but doing things like that for people just to show them that they matter means a lot at times. In a weird way, it's almost a form of ministry in and of itself, showing people what they matter enough to take time out of your day for them can mean all the world. This is where the story is going to become really strange, brother. 
On the evening of April 23rd, I was sitting in my chair just resting. It was kind of late in the evening. I was suddenly compelled by the Holy Spirit to get up and make something for you. I know I'm going to sound like a crazy person, but I feel like I need to tell you the whole truth for any of it to make sense. I'm not schizophrenic, and I don't hear an actual voice in my ear. Rather, I heard one straight to my heart. The Lord told me to get up and make you a specific stone knife and to send it to you. I quit questioning these things, and I now I just try to obey the Lord Jesus as it speaks. I wasted no time and got started. I thought, well, I may as well listen to one of your videos at the same time. I watch the majority of them, but I don't always get the notifications because of the YouTube algorithm su suppresses your channel. That's what a lot of people don't understand. This channel has been suppressed for about the last two, three years. And it's obvious. And even some data analysts have told me, Dave, it is being suppressed. So I normally have to go straight to the channel itself to catch the videos. And that's probably what most people need to do is just check into the channel itself. Don't look for YouTube to tell you because it's not going to happen. While I was sitting down preparing to make your blade with a piece of obsidian in my hand, I couldn't believe the episode that I was listening to. This was the episode where you were discussing cases in Mississippi and Arizona. It was a case in Mississippi regarding the gentleman who went missing in Panther Creek Swamp area. That truly shocked me. Dave, I know that area well. I was born and raised in Yazoo County. That's where it happened. Panther Creek is a place that I've visited many times. Urbanization has grown up around the area, and it's impossible, and I do mean impossible, to get lost. It would be even more unrealistic for someone to be lost there and not be found. It's not really a large area, and if a person just began walking in any direction, you'd emerge. What are the odds that I'd be compelled to start making a gift for you at the same time that I'm listening to one of your episodes? Regarding the area where I grew up in Yazoo County, Mississippi... It's not just the type of place that comes up very often. The odds that you'd be doing a video on that area and post it the day is, is truly odd. Yet I've noticed that ever since I abandoned atheism and gave my life to Christ, those synchronicities have happened more frequently. I sometimes think that it's out of one of the ways the Holy Spirit communicates to us. Of course, at the end of the day, I'm still just a simple soldier and not a philosopher. Whether I'm so brokenhearted for you over the loss of Ben, I'm 51 years old and the dad of four kids, it would totally crush me if I had the experience that you've had to go through. It did, and it still does. I believe that Ben is with him. I know you have certain concerns over specific things, and I'm not here to question any of them. I just want to encourage you by saying that Jesus never holds mental illness against anyone. I know that. You had discussed how Ben had searched various paths looking for answers before he went home to the Lord. He did. Searching various paths is a common thing for young people to do. And I have no doubt that Christ fully embraced him and is in his presence. I believe you will be with Ben. That's all I ask. I believe that the two of you will be together forever. You know, I've had told people tell me that Ben and I are long souls that have been together many times in the past. It's they tell me that. It bothers me that we had that time together and just the time you are starting to blossom that it was taken. In closing, I would like to thank you once more for all your work. I've, I've given you five stars on Amazon for your movies. I also recently received the UFO Connection movie poster as well. That is a fantastic poster. I love that imagery. Speaking of imagery, let me describe to you what you're looking at regarding the knife. And let me tell you, friends, it's quite, <laughs> quite a piece of work and art. I refer, I refer to this motif as Midnight in the Desert. The blade is made of smoke gray obsidian. The handle is out of a white-tailed deer bone. I chose the jawbone when being inspired by your discussion of chronic wasting disease. In your last movie where you talked about the declining deer population, you'll see a triangle-type UFO beaming down on a light on the desert floor on one side of the knife.
Hmm. Don't see that. Oh, right there. Right there. If you look closely, you'll see the faint outline of a coyote being enveloped by the light. The coyote is chosen because they are no more deer to be found. In the scene, all that is left are scavengers. It's my way of paying tribute to your work and the topics in the movie. The one thing that the Lord has put in my heart is to tell you this, paraphrasing the Apostle Paul. Right now we see glass, but dimly, yet it won't always be that way. In a way, David seeing through a glass dimly isn't much like walking through a desert at midnight. We can't see everything as it really is. And there are constant dangers all around, yet we are still promised a drying morning light. We love and blessings to you, Angie, and Christ. Before I forget, here's a photo I took of a sculpture I made for a friend. It was based on a description he saw of a Sasquatch in northeastern Oklahoma. Quite a job. Very good. That uh, Eastern Oklahoma is a very popular Bigfoot location. Been there many times, spoken at conferences there. You'll notice that there's no hair on the upper portion of the face. The cheekbones and forehead are bare, just like any other human being. This is how we described it and not my interpretation. I just thought you'd find that interesting. Looks like a hairy man and not an animal for sure. Yeah, and that's the way our drawings get, but uh, Certain people on the other side don't want to acknowledge that. Just saying. So, let me say this. I'm humbled and honored to get something like this. I know it took you hours and hours to make it. And I'm not saying your name to be evasive, but I'm trying to save your privacy. Thank you for this. Okay, got some letters for you. And before I get going into the letters, let me tell you that today's missing person story is equal to the most important story I've ever told you. I found this story that we're going to talk about today on the spur of the moment just fell into my lap, like a lot of things do. I've never heard anyone talk about this story. Story's only three years old, and it's, it's a devastating story. But you will see why I'm talking about it, because it is exactly right in line with my work. Just like I told you about Mr. Hagman the other day in Ohio, this one is even more on key, and you will see. This is a letter. Hey Dave, uh, something popped up on my YouTube feed that brought me back to my childhood and rekindled some thoughts about the nature of reality of Missing 411. On a, as a kid, I used to watch this show called Cold Shack, the Night Stalker series. If you've never watched that, watch the reruns. It's pretty good. According to Chris Carter, creator of The X-Files, this is one of his inspirations for his show. Cold Shack was a news reporter who investigated the supernatural. Funny, after my, after my Air Force career, I sort of did the same thing as a newspaper reporter editor, but my investigations were never as dramatic as Kolchak's. Uh, the, uh, there's an episode, and it's called Horror in the Heights. The intro serves to make the point, but the rest of it is so worth it. Basically, there are creatures out there that can manipulate how they are visually perceived. This luring hapless victims to their demise this would be a victim sees someone they trust, and then they get devoured. In the end, Kolchak is tested because the creature takes on the form of someone Kolchak loves and trusts. You have to watch it to see how it ends up. And again, it's called Horror in the Heights. This also brings me to a person called David Ick. In one of his books, Everything You Need to Know and I've Never Been Told. I wouldn't be surprised if this is in your library. Ick asserts a lot about our perception of the basis of reality and how beings mask their true appearance by hacking visual perception. There is a lot more to this explanation than this, but in a nutshell, beings can alter how they are perceived by others. 
This fits with the premise of the Kolchak episode, maybe a few of the X-Files as well. How does this apply to Missing 411? I remember one of the cases from one of your two first two books. Forgive me for not giving the exact case. A lady was seen looking off the trail. She seemed to be captivated by something in the woods off the trail. She stepped off the trail and was never found. Yes, that happened in a national park. She was on a, uh, uh, she was with a school that was taking a day trip to the park. And several people saw her looking down off the trail. She was by herself. And then everyone saw her step off. She was never seen again. This brings me to a couple of speculative possibilities. One is can a creature mimic something it thinks we find interesting? And it could possibly generate this appearance by someone appearing what it thinks we want to see. Could it generate this visual from our own thoughts, memories, desires? That'd be a good one. And two, something knows us humans pretty well, just like fly fishermen know fish pretty well. <laughs> we think we know fish pretty well. But that's why it's called fishing and not catching. <laughs> and those fly fishermen use lures that are masterly crafted to lure the fish into taking the bait. Something might know us humans as well to craft something to allure us. And there are certainly more possibilities. With that, I thought about concerns that changing the visual perception to entice victims into vanishing to what end is unknown. Do these enticed, lured people become a meal? Do they enter another dimension or another civilization, a breakaway civilization or another realm of existence? Good questions. I enjoyed your bee segment. So just so you know, I did a segment next to the river all about bees. Click on the videos. If, as you're looking at your screen right below, it says videos. Click on that and it'll take you to it. And just a little bit down the line there, you'll see the one on bees. My wife Stephanie and I used to teach Suzuki Method violin lessons in Gainesville, Florida. And many of her clientele professionals in and around the University of Florida, including lawyers, doctors, and professors. You never knew who you'd encounter while students were being taught. I ended up speaking with a professor at UF who studied bees and he told me a lot about them. Colony collapse disorder. I've been following the story for many years and thank you for bringing it up to your audience. Just want to thank you as always for all you've done and are doing. I encourage you to watch the one episode of Kolchak, The Night Stalker, but of course understand you're busy. It generated some thoughts to me to the extent of 411, thought you might find it interesting. Take care and God bless your family. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. And I'll try to watch that Kolchak episode. Hey Dave, you have so many grateful for what you do. I admire what you're doing. Brief on me, I'm a canine handler, patrol officer, SWAT officer, canine trainer. I spent 10 years in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kurdistan, and others. You're so busy, I'll keep it short. I got tired of all the evil in the USA and attacks on God and family and moved to Thailand three years ago. And now Vietnam is a beautiful place. If you need anything checked out in Asia, I'm pretty well wired in. I, I know you have huge connections now. I just wanted to put it out there. Also, when I was 19, my best buddy and I were coming back around a reservoir when we both stopped to look at the water. Excellent fish in there. As it backs up to a vast forest and mountain area, we saw the exact, and I mean exact, triangle craft on your book cover, not plus 90 feet by 90 feet hovering over the reservoir. Not a sound. He means that one right there. 30 years later, I still haven't figured out that one out. If you have a theory, if you must, as it's on the, it's not on the book cover, it's on the cover of the, uh, my DVD. The answer to this, TR, like Tom Robert, TR3B. Look at that, TR3B. Wish there was a way I would help on your project we're building an animation and video business here. We want to make up lifting animation for kids, give them inspiring messages. You do good work, brother. Be safe. Well, since you are in Vietnam, if you're watching, there's been a lot of stories from soldiers about a Bigfoot-type creature in the mountains of Vietnam and Thailand. Maybe you could check that out for me. True, false, or whatever. And then he sent a picture of his team in Kandahar. Great picture. Another thing, since you were in Kandahar, what about the Kandahar giant? True or false? Made up? 
Could it be true? Thanks for your service to our country. You are appreciated. Next letter. Just watch your video on bees. Very interesting. I had no idea how instrumental they are for the development of our food sources. Very well laid out. On another note, searching through my old UFO research material, came across a young Bruce McAbee photo. See, it's tip. The boy next to the picture reads, Reporter Quentin Fogarty shows a path UFO took over Christchurch. Australian pilot Frederick Valenich vanished. Did a video about that. It's on this channel. You can watch it. You can read the entire Australian account online. The thing that really got me interested, however, was this quote of two Americans that w went missing. Several of our planes have vanished, and even the FBI has to admit that they couldn't explain the bizarre disappearances of airport, airplane pilot Carl Hunrath and Wilbur Wilkinson. In a nutshell, Dave, trying to keep my email short, the article suggests that these two men in 53 contacted a race of aliens through channeling and trances and disappeared with them. When Williamson started to channel, was something truly unexplainable. Williamson would begin speaking in several different voices, one right after the other. It was uncanny and eerie. So Dave, thanks for your research. I'm leaning towards these aliens being interdimensional. This also aligns with retired FBI agent Don, John D'Souza's thoughts. And for me, it's the only way I can mentally grapple with the channeling phenomenon. In many ways, the story is very appreciative. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hey Dave, I'd like to contribute to the talk about bovine and other animal mutilations. For purposes of this letter, let us, let us suppose the mutilations are not human nor earth, neither predatory nor other natural interventions. For the moment, we will also not consider the crime scene in the event area and instead focus on some, several basic biological peculiarities in these events. In mutilation scenes, the following are common. No or very little blood on site in the animal, missing body parts, surgical type incisions, extraction of organs and genitalia. Short review of the body parts and items taken reveal the following are missing. Reproductive organs, ovaries, udders, rectums, mouth, lip, cheeks, tongues, eyes, tear ducts, occasionally parts of the brain and lymph nodes. The ovary is the primary reproductive organ and has two important functions producing the female reproductive cell, the egg or the ovum, and producing the hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Several reproduction in cows depends on hormones, which are specific chemical substances produced by specialized glands called endocrine glands. These secretions pass into the blood and lymph fluids and are transported to various parts of the body where they exert several specific effects. Reproductive hormones may originate in the hypothalamus, pituitary, gonads, uterus, and placenta. Hypothalamic hormones are produced in the hypothalamus, a portion of the brain that is a neutral control center of reproductive hormones. The primary releasing of the hormone or the reproduction is releasing a hormone that controls the release of the follicle stimulating a hormone. Mutilations have been going on for decades. The same organs and body parts are missing every time. Why is it that someone keeps coming back to take more of those items? If the culprits are aliens with spectacular capabilities of faster than light and possible interdimensional travel, how is it that they cannot reproduce these basic chemicals or hormones? Who's saying that they can't? My question is, maybe they are monitoring our primary food source. Maybe there's something in that food source that's killing us. Maybe there's something in that food source that they want to understand. And is there a network of aliens advertising to each other that desirous and hard to reproduce hormone compounds can be found on Earth and nowhere else? Come and get it. It's as if to speculate. There's a human-alien hybrid breeding program. Can we further speculate on what mutilations provide support genetic stabilization of the offspring? See, I, don't, I think it's possible, but it's just not in my... Bailiwick. And why is it not? Because there's two types of groups mutilating cows, not one. I believe, and I say this because people way smarter than me have said it, 
there's people on earth that are doing these mutilations and there's people from somewhere else doing the mutilations. There's two. And why are there two? Because there's two different types. David, while you were discussing the portal theory on the Joshua Tree in Vermont cases, I recall the guy in one of your books, a hunter, I believe was walking towards what appeared a shimmering veil or some sort of vision in reality. Yeah, I remember that. He got real close, moved his foot forward, and it vanished, at which point he turned and got the hell out of there. Portals are all over the planet because they are influenced by mag magnetic anomalies that can crop up anywhere. Jerry Wills went to Aramu, Maru in Peru and sang three tones a shaman gave him while meditating in front of the devil's doorway, as sometimes called. His experience will blow you away. Check him out on YouTube. He gives a talk on it. I got to do that. Next one. Hey, Dave, I've been following your efforts since your first appearance on Coast to Coast. I purchased three of your books, all of your videos, and always watch and listen to your YouTubes. I salute you for your time and effort. It's sad but amazing, as it's like sci-fi reality. Yeah. My heartfelt condolences go out to you and everyone that has lost someone, especially under the circumstances you present to us. I'm 62 and I've been happily married for 44 years and reside in Chandler, Arizona, just east of Phoenix. I have two events that may be of interest to you and the villagers. The first occurred in November 1990 in Montauk, Long Island. It was our wedding anniversary and we spent the night at a resort at the end of the island. We had lived on Long Island until 92. I always had an interest in the unknown and kept myself updated on the subject. During the afternoon, my wife and I took a walk for about a mile to the old Montauk military base. It's been closed for many years and I heard all the stories and thought it'd be fun to explore a little. Spooky place. Instead of gaining access from the shoreline, we walked along an eight-foot chain-link fence that encompassed a facility along the roadway. Okay, I should stop here and say, Google that facility and see some of the strange stuff that went on there. If you could envision a very sandy terrain with many dense small trees and tall beach grass, like a rainforest, at one point the sand had eroded from the fence, allowing us to slip right under and continue walking along the fence line until we came to an old jeep road that was heavily overgrown. Walking south, we could see the old radar tower about a quarter mile down the shore. It was a beautiful sunny day, about three in the afternoon, and not much noise other than us walking. About halfway down, we startled as, we, as a voice came over a loudspeaker directly behind us. Stop. You're on government property. As we both turned around, we were shocked to see a green military blazer five feet behind us with a uniformed guard speaking to us through a mic and speaker. He asked if we had a permit. I said no. He then stated we were trespassing on government property and invited us to turn around and exit the way we came in. I realized that doesn't sound too strange. However, the path we were walking on was about three feet in width, and the tree branches were overgrown into what was a narrow dirt road. Second, as he backed up into the tall beach grass and bushes off to the side, you could hear branches snapping and crunching as well as the sound of the engine. Prior to hearing this stop, we heard we heard no one driving up on us and the brush and branches cracking. It was as if he was instantly behind us without driving. After he backed up and we started to leave, there was only one set of tire tracks in the sand to where he had backed into, none pulling out or onto the main road. As we walked out, my wife asked, where the hell did he come from? She said she didn't hear anyone pull up behind us and thought it was strange to see the late, say the least. I can only leave it to you and the villagers to speculate what happened? I told you that place was a strange place. Second instance occurred 1995, late September, early October. Living, we were living then in Chandler. It was around 8 p.m. one evening. My wife was at the supermarket, and I was at home with two of our sons. She called me and said, you have to go outside and look into the sky towards the supermarket and for me to tell her what I see. My son and I went out front, and in a normal Arizona sky, we both saw a small red light at what would I would guess 10,000 feet to the west of our location. It's about the size of a nail head from our perspective. I can describe the red light as intense and not blinking. All three of us watched for about a minute while still on the phone with my wife at the supermarket. We then all observed an identical red come from the north to meet up with the first red light. The second light was going twice as fast as a commercial jet as we see many jets flying into Sky Harbor at Phoenix, 15 miles away. 
The two red lights are now next to each other and stationary. About two minutes have passed now, and what happened next was the first red light went east, and the second north as if it were shot out of a gun. No sound, no smoke or trail, just gone. Like on Star Trek, a true unknown, Dave. Lastly, I want to pass along something that I heard discussed only once regarding Roswell. As we have all heard thousands of reports and testimonies on the incident, only once did I hear this from a researcher on a radio show. Sorry, I don't know who or what show it was. It was stated in their research on government records regarding Roswell. They found that in the year month of July 4, 1947, the Roswell city government spent 20 times what it had usually on operating expenses for all years prior to the next 25 years after 47. If that's true, and can likely be confirmed, it would make it the most costly test balloon in the era. Nowadays, we obviously spend millions to shoot them down. I thought you and the villagers would like a challenge on any truth to that. Please know that all your efforts are not only helping people to open their minds, it's helpful to know that someone actually cares to do the research. Absolutely. I do care. So, as you guys know, Joe Hauser at the Montana Vortex is a very, very, very good friend. So, we always share UFO pictures. So this is about dusk. Still kind of light outside. It was over the western sky of northern Montana. No other star was in the sky. You couldn't see anything in the sky except this. And it wasn't quite dark. So what I did is I took that picture and... I blew it up. And what I found is it's not, there's actually another object right down here to the lower right that you couldn't see it unless you blew this up. So I did this a few times. And then I did it at nighttime. And you can actually see more structure at night. And I'm not talking about, it almost looks oval here, but there's something underneath and there's something on the side. Very odd, underneath, on the side. Joe went out and took a picture of it too. And uh, we both agree that, here's, here's another picture of it. Not all blown up. Definitely not a star. And if you had to ask me what it is, I've got no clue, but it's not normal definitely not normal another picture of it where you can see something below it for sure now just so people understand this isn't a satellite satellites move very slowly across the sky this doesn't move at just about dusk it just appears now during the daylight I look for it all the time. But at about 7.30, 8 o'clock, we get, it stays light up here until 10 o'clock at night right now. And later on in the year, it'll be like 11.30 and it's only dark between say 11.30 and 4.30 in the morning. We get a lot of good sunshine and we get our plants growing really well. <laughs> That's why. So, the, uh, the UFO, that's a new one. The other one that I had taken a picture of before is gone. And that is very odd. The other UFO leaves, this one shows up. And then as the Earth rotates, it is rotating with the Earth, but it's, it's not that high in the sky. Very strange, very strange. So, let me get on to the, the disappearance. This is a lengthy one. And when I got into it, when I first started to research it, I knew right away this is going to be a milestone case. 
it. It involves a little boy. And this one, I had to stop a couple times and walk out and tell Angie, I said, hey, this one's bothering me a lot. Shed a few tears over it, let me tell you. Because I fell for this family. His name was Brayden Scott Ackerman, four years old, weighed 40 pounds. He went missing May 22nd, year 2000, Orange City, Iowa. Let me show you where Orange City is. And the location of this is quite important. Missouri River, right here. Mississippi River, up here. Minneapolis-St. Paul is right over here. This is Sioux Falls, and this is Des Moines. So you can kind of see where in Iowa this is happening. This is Orange City, right here. Very important. Right between two of the biggest rivers in the United States, and in an area that in Iowa, there's nine missing persons cases. When you get over to the other side of the Missouri River, bango, everything stops. And I can't explain that. I can't. And I don't understand it. But I think that plays into what we're dealing with on Missing 411. So this happened in Orange City, right on the outskirts. Brayton's parents are Brad and Beth. And they're corn farmers. The heart of America. The heart of America. Now Brayton has two sisters. And on May 22nd, 2000, the family decided that they were going to go to a local creek and go fishing. Now Brayton, at four years old, it was said that his his biggest, funnest, most greatest time was always to be on his bicycle. He also liked to take four-wheeler rides with his parents. But his favorite pastime above everything was fishing. So May 22nd was a Sunday. And Brad and Beth decided to take the kids down to Willow Creek. Willow Creek. And a family friend went with them. And it was a very old concrete bridge that went over this little creek. Now, it, re it had rained recently. The creek was running a little higher than it normally did. But it, wasn't, it isn't a huge creek. It was very close to the grandparents' house, about two miles from their house. And when they went on this, for some reason, the parents didn't carry their cell phones. Key point. Key point. So the family did what they always did. They'd been to this location before. Brayton likes to catch the fish in the creek. So they sit on the bridge and they put their rod over the side and they fish the creek. Idyllic. <laughs> That's the way I was raised. And if I was four years old, if I could have answered, I probably would have said fishing was my favorite thing to do, too. So they're sitting on the bridge. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. What time is the greatest time to have a disappearance? 4 o'clock. So Brad and Beth facing downstream. And all the girls are facing downstream. Brayton's behind his mom and dad. Everything around that area is soybeans. Further out is corn. It's, it's a brand new crop. Nothing's grown heavy. Fields are flat. You can see for miles. Parents said that they turned their back less than a minute. And they turned back around and Brayton is gone. 
Well, they scan the fields. They're in the middle of nowhere, no cars. Nobody else but them and the friend and the girls. Brain's gone. And they've been facing downstream. Never heard a splash. Never saw anything floating downstream. Never heard a sound like Brayton walking away. Well, Dave, that sounds pretty strange. Oh, yeah. That's really strange, folks. So Brad and Beth run down the creek, look around the fields. One of them leaves to call the sheriff. And by the, by the time darkness is happening, they've got the sheriff there. They've got a lot of searchers there. Everyone's looking around. Now what happens, folks, is I'd like to say this is one of the greatest searches I've ever, ever read about. But before we go a lot further, this is the map. This is Orange City right here. This is Alton, A-L-T-O-N. And that bridge is right here, very close to Alton. This is where it all happened, in the middle of the heartland. One more time, Missouri River, Mississippi River, right there, Des Moines, Sioux Falls. So you have it in your mind where this is happening. So the family's looking like for Mad for Brayton. May 23rd, Monday. The sheriff, super smart guy, he had already called out on the evening of the 22nd for some crews to go 10 and 20 miles downstream on Willow Creek and dam the creek, just in case the bodies in the creek. And they knew the rate of flow in the creek and how far a body would flow at 40 pounds in that little tiny creek. Well, Willow Creek flows into what's called the Floyd River. The Floyd River flows into the Missouri River. The sheriff also made a request for mutual aid to get search dogs in. And three search dogs came from Coddington, South Dakota on the 23rd. And on that Monday morning, folks, on that Monday morning, four hundred searchers showed up. Four hundred. It's about 30 miles from where Brayton was last seen to the Floyd River. They searched all day. They searched the fields. They searched everywhere you can imagine. Canines never picked up a scent. One dog on the following day, the 24th, picked up a slight scent right where the parents we're sitting at the cement bridge. Well, duh, that's where Brayton was sitting and last seen, but no other places. So what'd they do? They brought in more heavy equipment and they took out the bridge, just in case Brayton was in it somehow, below it somehow, under a cement block somewhere. There was nothing left unturned. So on the 24th, Tuesday, heavy equipment pulled out the sides of Willow Creek for 20 miles on both sides of the creek, in case the boy somehow slipped under, in case Brayton somehow was trapped under a cement block, something. They also brought in a specialized water search team from South Dakota that worked with the sheriff to put in cyclone fences at the locations where the different dams were built to make sure nothing got past there. Dams and water and fields were searched out to four miles, which was a ridiculous time because there's no way that Brayton could have got that far from his parents without being seen in that less than a minute time frame. 
See where I'm going with this? May 26th, Thursday. 300 searchers. They had people in the water up to their necks searching and looking for anything abnormal. They brought in scuba divers to search the deeper ponds that were made by the damming of the creek. They sent scuba divers down to the Floyd River to search and look. And starting on the 24th through the 27th, they had a helicopter in the sky searching the fields, the water, the area, anything. The following day, 300 searchers again. And again, they repeated everything. The sheriff said every rock in that creek had been turned over at least three times, down to 20 to 30 miles away, where it flows into the Floyd River. I cannot begin to fathom the pain the Ackermans went through in missing their son. A highly religious family. They kept holding out hope that Brayton would be found alive. So he went missing on a Sunday. That Friday, the family held religious services praying for Brayton. And then immediately after that, they went back to the search. Iowa had state cadaver dogs at this point which is a hard thing for parents to swallow. Cadaver dogs means there's no more hope. When the body dies, it gives off gas. And that gas it gives off, if you've ever searched and you've been around a body that's been found, it's horrendous, it stinks. But in minute quantities, we can't smell it, but canines can. So when a body is fresh, Canines can pick it up where we won't. And they brought in cadaver dogs on Friday after the services. They continued to scour the banks with heavy equipment. The sheriff said that it was impossible for that body to get past any of the bottom two dams. He said it was impossible. Impossible was his words. There were some things said about Brayton. There was family was given a lot of interviews. And he had a lot of cousins and friends. He went to a local nursery school. And his parents always kidded him and said, yo, your, your favorite saying. He goes, yeah, he did it. It was his favorite saying, he did it. <laughs> this was in Sioux County. And the sheriff was a man named Dan Altina. It had rained multiple days during that first week of the search. The sheriff said that people didn't care. They put on rain gear and ponchos and they marched around out there for 10, 12, 14 hours a day. He said it was the most unbelievable search effort in his entire career. He said that there were people there from states and states away they interviewed searchers who said that they weren't doing this for them. They were doing it for the family. And then five days later, they said, we're not leaving until we find them. The sheriff said that there were thousands of hours committed to the search. And again, he reiterated on this fifth, sixth, seventh day, that every creek, every rock in that creek had been overturned at least three times. He said that cadaver dogs had walked the creek at least 10 times. Search dogs had searched the fields at least five times. After seven days, the formal search and rescue for Brayton was over. Informal went on for two weeks. And then on August 31st, Brayton disappeared May 22nd. August 31st. By that time, the water had receded significantly in the creek. 
It was a lot more shallow. And there was a massive second search and rescue. Just say search. And what they were looking for is anything to point to the fact that Brayton was in that water. They were looking for torn clothing, pieces of clothing, cadaver hits. Ironically, they found bones. Turned them over to the Iowa State Bureau of Investigation. Bones were all animal. Cows, things like that. Now this is important. Brayton was last seen wearing blue jeans and a lime green tank top. And no shoes. Now when you look up the last name Ackerman, different sites say different things, but multiple sites say it's German. But that light and green tank top and no shoes and no phone by the parents, I can tell you how that rung in my soul. Several during the interview in August, the sheriff said that he knew several search and rescue canine handlers that had come back every weekend since May, searching the bank, searching the creek, and searching fields. Brad, Brad Ackerman, Brayton's dad, he was interviewed after they failed on the August search. This was his quote. He said, the experts told me if he, if Brayton, if he went, if he went in the water, he'd be between the damned areas. And they had some of the best experts in the world there. Water experts. If they said that, I believe them. So here's some things to think about. There's open fields all the way around there. And it's now been almost the third year anniversary is coming up. Brayton wasn't in a field. If he was in a field, one of the farmers would have found him, his body by now. Gone through many, multiple grow cycles on the farm. He wasn't there. Creek was essentially drained by August, September, just a trickle, a little bit of water to keep the fish alive. Brayton wasn't there. They didn't find any clothing at all. None. The immediate response by the sheriff damned the creek. I would say that would be the right thing to do as long as you're not pulling searchers off to do it have heavy equipment operators do that. But that was a smart move. Very smart. Judge the flow of the creek. They did. Bring in expert water consultants, search and rescue consultants, which they did and search the creek all the way to the Floyd River, which they did. Then they took a helicopter and they searched all of that area every day for four days, which they did. So let's think about this. The family is sitting above water. They probably brought in an excess of 25 different canines with different functions. Some were scent sniffing, some were cadaver. The only scent was found right around that cement bridge, which they demolished and searched. And they found nothing. Now, when the Ackermans are sitting facing downstream, and Brayton is behind them. Let's pretend that he fell in. 
Well, I think you would hear that. Number one. Number two. I think you may see the boy floating down right below your feet, which they didn't. If Raiden had walked away, how fast could a boy walk away in bare feet? In less than a minute. Point of separation. When they turned around, something happened. Have you guys ever watched the special I made for the History Channel called Vanished? Vanished. And then have you ever watched this movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection? You can watch them both right now on Amazon. Both are, are directed toward a possible cause. In Vanished, we interviewed a physicist, a NASA physicist, that talked about a case where somebody disappeared. And he said that, Dave, the possibilities are that a portal took them. And he said that they were studying portals to understand how you, they could arm them. Meaning that, and he said this, he said, Dave, I know in a lot of your books, you write and say that the parents say that their son was right next to them and they turn their back and next second later that their son's gone. It's like they had no time to go anywhere. Just like Brayton Ackerman. I said, yes, sir, that's exactly the way. And he says, so it doesn't happen while the parent's watching. It happens when there's no eyes on the victim. Exactly. Then in Missing 411, the UFO connection, we interviewed a hunter who was abducted. And then a whole series of hunters that went missing that were German. And I've told you before, the research shows that an abnormal number of Germans disappear. Now, I'm not saying conclusively that Brayton was German because there's a lot of a lot online that says different countries are the origination of Ackerman, but there was a lot there that said Ackerman was German. So three years, Brayton's never been found. Do I think he's in the creek? No, I don't. Do I think he's in the field? Uh, no, I don't. I think the searchers did an outstanding job. I think the community rallied to the Ackerman's assistance, need of assistance. I saw Mr. Ackerman interviewed. And I can only say that he held it together probably the way I would have, barely. And I've talked about this before. He, lived, he doesn't live that far from this creek. To go back, plow your fields, pick your corn. I don't know how life goes on after this. I don't know how Brad and Beth Ackerman held it together. They had to have done it and they knew they had to do it for their daughters. But to lose Brayton, my gosh, what is going on? I don't want you to think I'm overdoing this, but I want you to know that there's something going on here. This is probably the greatest example of what I've tried to explain over the years that I've ever found. In this instance, I don't think Brayton was returned. He left. He's gone. And as much as I know about search and rescue, I don't know what else could have been done. I don't think anything else could have been done. They depleted their cities around them of people. 
There were articles saying that businesses closed just to help the Ackerman search. They tore down a bridge. I read about this story, and I came that close to getting on a plane and flying out to meet Mr. Ackerman. Something told me not to do it. Too, too short. It's been, it hasn't been long enough yet. He needs to heal some more. But Sheriff Altina, I know you haven't had many of these cases in your career, because you couldn't have. But you stood up and you did the right thing. You did exactly what you should have done. Don't hold, hold yourself accountable for what happened. And Brad and Beth, don't you either. Something else beyond your control happened here. I'll never forget this case, ever. I hope I do get to meet the Ackerman someday. But I pray for their family that they heal. Thanks for being here. Politis out. <laughs>